Okay, so now we're going to solve some more complicated linear inequalities. Not horrible, uh, basically just some stuff with distributions, some simplifications, some fractions, decimals, and word problems. Um, honestly, just some really good practice. So the same exact rules apply here, we're just going to have more stuff to do with those rules. Now I also want to clear up some things uh, about when you reverse inequalities and when you don't. So we're going to notice some distribution and we're going to notice uh, that that doesn't change anything about your inequality as far as the, the reversing goes. So let's take a look at these. Number one, we got a couple examples with a lot of distribution going on and we see that they're linear inequalities. You got one variable raised to the first power and you have not an equal sign. You've got this relationship that says one side is going to be greater than the other side or less than the other side. So let's start here. If this were a linear equation, a linear equality, we would just start by simplifying and that's exactly what we're going to do here. Keep in mind that when we simplify, yeah we're distributing and yes distribution is multiplication but please listen here. This is not when you reverse the inequality. When you distribute, yes, it's multiplying, but it's not multiplying to both sides. That is the action that reverses the inequality. So when you distribute negative 1 and you get negative x minus 1, that is only affecting one side. You do not touch that inequality. In fact, this didn't even relate to the other side yet. This is just simplifying one side. So same rules apply. Simplify both sides. minus x or negative x minus 1 and 3x minus 6. No problem. We didn't divide by a negative. We multiplied only one side by distribution, but we're not to do anything to both sides here. Your inequality cannot change yet. After this, we're kind of home free. We dealt with an example in the last video very similar to this. Get rid of your smaller variable, which would be adding x, or if you choose, Subtract 3x to keep your variable on the left hand side. There's pros and cons to both. I don't care what you do. I'm going to follow my own steps though. At the very end, I'm going to have to reverse my inequality anyway. I'll be picking it up and switching it around because right now my variable is going to change, well not change sides, but my, my variable will be remaining on the right hand side. I'm going to get rid of my smaller variable by adding subtracting. That's negative 1, 4x minus 6. Uh, because I did not divide by a negative, I don't change the inequality. I'm just going to continue to solve this. Uh, we're going to look for where our variable's at. That side drives the problem. We're going to get rid of anything that's connected by addition subtraction first. That's minus 6. The opposite of that is adding 6. That gives you positive 5. That gives you 4x. And because I didn't divide by a negative, I still keep that inequality the same. Lastly, we know this. The last step is always division when we have a coefficient. So we're going to divide both sides by 4. You know, sometimes uh, students hear things and they think it's one thing and, and they, they just use the rule I tell them all the time. Listen, just because you're dividing doesn't mean you're reversing inequalities. Only when you're dividing on both sides by a negative. That's all, that's the only time you do that. Basically, it's in the very last step of your problem uh, when you're solving for your variable. So, yeah, we divided, but we didn't divide by a negative. That does not reverse inequality. What is going to reverse inequality is this is written out of order for me. I like my variable on the left hand side because then my inequality points to the direction on my number line that I should be graphing. So I'm going to pick this whole thing up. I'm going to reverse it. That means that x is on the left, 5 fourths is on the right, and because I'm reversing the inequality, I've got to reverse the inequality. That's the idea I'm trying to get you to learn. So, same exact technique, distribution, distribution. Um, combine like terms, we didn't have any. Get rid of the smaller variable, yeah, of course. Could you have done it differently? No problem. Just if you subtract 3x, you're going to get negative 4x, and you'll have to divide by negative. Ultimately, you're going to be reversing your inequality no matter what. Um, so that's either way that you want to go on that one. doesn't really matter to me. Uh, get rid of my constant by addition subtraction. That can't change the inequality no matter what. Dividing, that could change the inequality if you divide on both sides, but only if you divide on both sides by negative. What changed it here was my writing this in order. So we're going to finish it up, this up with our number line and our interval notation. Because I wrote this in order, and because we're dealing with a number line, I don't even care where the 5 fourths is really. I don't care what it is. It's just 5 fourths. My inequality tells us that we should be 
graphing to the left. Those are all the numbers that are less than 5 fourths. And the equal sign says, hey, the 5 fourths itself, that one number that keeps both sides equal to each other, that's included. So we're going to change back to interval notation now. This interval starts all the way to the left. It starts way over here. It ends at 5 fourths. Always use parentheses for infinities. That's about it. I would really highly encourage you to try that problem on your own. Of course, I'm going to get started on it right now. I'm going to work through it quickly, though. Um, so try that on your own. See if you can distribute that. See if you can get rid of the smaller variable. Uh, if you don't want to get rid of the smaller variable and keep your variable on the left-hand side, think about that. At the very end, what I want is I want you to switch the, the inequality, reverse it only when appropriate, and I want you to end with your variable on the left-hand side. That makes it easier to graph. So I'm going to erase this. If you want to pause the video and do that now, go ahead and do it. So I'm going to get to it here. So if this were a linear equation, I'd start by simplifying both sides. Left side looks great. Right side looks like crap. So let's simplify that. I'm going to take and distribute, not to the one that's outside the parentheses, and we'll have 4x, no problem there. We'll have less than or equal to. I know that for sure, no matter what, because I'm not working on both sides of my equation or my inequality yet. I can't reverse inequality if I'm only working on one side or if I'm simplifying. Only when you divide both sides by a negative, basically at the end of your problem, would you ever do that. This would give us negative 21. Oh, plus. Negative times a negative is a positive. Plus 6x plus 1. Do not do anything to both sides of your inequality yet. Just like equations, you need to combine like terms first. There's none here, but there certainly are here. Combine like terms takes ambiguity out of your problem. Uh, basically, before you start working on both sides, adding and subtracting to both sides, you should have at most four terms, two on one side and two on the other side. If you have more than two terms on either side, you need to be combining like terms here. So in this case, we have negative 20 plus 6x or 6x minus 20, either one you want to do there. Now, I like to get rid of the smaller variable, but I did that in the last problem, so I'm going to give you the other option. I know that I could be subtracting 4x here. I'd be getting 0. That'd be totally fine. You can get that. You could do minus 4x, get 0 is less than or equal to negative 20 plus 2x. Add the 20 to both sides. Remember, your variable side drives a problem. Get rid of your constant term first. Add the 20. And divide by 2. You get 10 is less than x. That's fine. I would want you to reverse that and get x is greater than or equal to 10. Now, I'm going to show you the other option here. Let's say that you see this and you go, you know what? I really don't want to have to reverse the end. I don't like doing that. Well, that's okay. You can get rid of the smaller variable or you can get rid of the larger variable. What's going to happen, though, is if you get rid of the larger variable, keep this in your mind, that you're going to eventually have to divide by a negative. In this case, we get negative 2x. 4x minus 6x, negative 2x. I don't switch my inequality because even though I'm working on both sides and even though I got a negative here, I'm not dividing by a negative. And then, then your last step. You've got a coefficient. You've got to get rid of it. We'll divide by negative 2. But as soon as I say that, it clues my mind, I'm dividing by negative 2. I don't care that I'm getting positive 10. Look at that. If I get negative 2 divided by negative 2, that's positive 1. 1 times x is x. Negative 20 divided by negative 2, that's positive 10. It's not the fact that I'm getting a positive or negative that matters. It's the fact that I divided by a negative that matters here. I have to reverse the inequality. And that's exactly what I referenced earlier. If you do the other way, if you subtract 4x and add 20, you divide by 2, but your inequality would be wrong. We'd switch it around and get x is greater than or equal to 10 anyway. So no matter how you do this, no matter how, what makes sense to you best, um, you're going to get the same answer. We choose the way that looks best to you. That's fine. As long as you're following the rules that I'm telling you, you're going to be good to go. We'll wrap this up pretty quickly. Because my, vari because my variable is on the left-hand side, I can start at 10. It points to the right. 
I include the value itself that makes both sides equal given my greater than or equal to, I take that, make my interval notation out of it starting at 10, ending at infinity, using brackets for the number to include it in the interval, in the interval and the solution set. Infinities can't be included in use parentheses. That's the whole shebang. Now, we're going to run into some fractions and decimals. Um, hopefully this makes sense to you because we're going to get things like this a lot. Test questions usually look about like that. Fractions and decimals, at this point, I'm hoping that they're not as intimidating to you. I gave you a really good way to deal with fractions and decimals in linear equations. And you know what? It still works. That's pretty cool. And because we always associate negatives with numerators, when we get rid of our fractions, we don't even have to worry about the inequality. It works exactly the same way as equations. Let me show that to you with uh, two quick examples. One fraction, one decimal. We'll deal with word problem, and then uh, we'll be done. Now, if you remember, I hope that you do, if not, maybe take some time and go look at linear, equa linear equations with fractions. Because the same exact technique that we use there is what's going to happen here. You see, I, I kind of promised you something. I told you that everything that works for linear equations works for linear equalities. There's just one additional rule. If you multiply or divide by a negative, you must reverse inequality. So when we dealt with linear equations, we had fractions. The first thing I told you to do was, hey, make everything a fraction. That means that we can float all our variables up to numerators. Instead of 3 sevenths x, we can make 3x over 7. Plus 2 sevenths, that looks great. Greater than, sure, leave it. It, it acts just like an equation with that one exception. And that we want our variable on the left-hand side. Now. Here's what's kind of cool about this. I gave you a, a technique way back in, in linear equations because I kind of I kind of teach where you're going as well. Um, the things that I teach you now, you're going to be using forever. They're, they're not going to change. So when I told you to float negatives up to the numerator, it's so that your denominator is always positive. The reason why that's important is because you'll never have to multiply by a negative to get rid of your denominator. That's neat because that means you don't have to worry about reversing your inequality. So when we write this as a fraction, you make sure that that negative floats up to the numerator. Instead of negative 1 7th x, we get negative 1 x over 7. Notice how my denominator is positive. When we multiply by the LCD like we're about to do here in this problem, we're not going to be multiplying by negative. We're not going to be reversing inequality. That's only the last step, and if you follow my steps, it's only the last step when you divide. So we write everything as a fraction. If this were an equation right now, I'd be asking for the LCD, and you know what? We're going to do the same thing. The LCD here is, it's not 7. It's not uh, the biggest factor. It's the smallest multiple that everything divides. So we'd say 7. Well, no, 14 is going to 7. You start with the largest denominator. Let's try 14. Hey, 7 divides 14. Ding, ding, ding. We're done. And what we did in linear equations is we multiplied every single term, all four of them, all, everything that you see, every fractional fractions, both sides, every term, whatever, by the LCD. Hey, did you just multiply both sides? Sure you did. Did you multiply both sides by negative? Absolutely not. If you follow my steps, you put negatives on numerators, you never will. So you should not be changing your inequality when you're getting rid of fractions. All this does is helps you simplify, we've done this before, simplify your fraction, multiply what you have left over, simplify your fraction, multiply what you have left over, do not change inequality, you're not multiplying by negative, simplify your fraction, multiply what you have left over, simplify your fraction, you get one here, and that changes some, and the changes in inequality is something that's really manageable for you. We did this last video. We had something real similar to this video. Um, in this case, I certainly would add two to both sides. It's gonna keep my variable on the left, which is where I want it, and it's getting rid of the smaller variable here. So we're gonna add two x. Everything's already simplified, no like terms. Get rid of your smaller variable. 
Because I'm not dividing by a negative, don't even think about changing that inequality. All we have is negative 5. We're trying to get 0, so we're adding and subtracting. After that, our variable side drives our problem. Get rid of our constant term first by addition and subtraction. We're trying to get zeros here. Yeah, we're going to get negative 9, but we're not dividing by a negative. So keep that inequality the way it is. Last step, we're dividing by 8. If we're dividing, that's the time when you got to focus here. If we're dividing, you check whether you're dividing by a negative. Not that we're getting a negative, dividing by a negative. Since we're not, we do not change that inequality. Our variable is on the left-hand side. It looks fantastic. We want to check our work, make sure that we got rid of fractions okay. We multiply what we had left over. No problem. We get rid of a smaller variable. We kept our variable on the left-hand side. Got rid of a constant term. And last thing, we divided. And if we didn't divide by a negative, in that step, you're not changing your inequality at all. You do have to end appropriately. You do have to end in the right direction. It's in this case, literally the right direction. Go to the right here. Numbers larger than negative 9 eighths are to the right. Do we use a bracket or parentheses? What do you think? Look back at the problem. Is the negative 9 eighths included or not? The original problem tells you, or following it all the way down, it says, no, no, no. We can't include the number that makes both sides equal. We need numbers that are literally bigger, only to the right. Parentheses show us that. Also, our interval notation starts where our interval starts ends where our interval ends and we're done we're going to do one more here but this is an important one it, it needs to be kind of solid in your head that what we do with equations is what we do with inequalities it's just we're getting a lot more answers and those answers are represented by an interval any number between negative 9 8 and infinity actually works in that inequality it's kind of crazy that's a lot of freaking numbers okay the one thing that you have to look out for is keep your variable on the left when you're done and if you divide by a negative, reverse your inequality. Let's look at decimals. We'll try one word problem that's going to be probably relevant to you uh, since you're taking math classes and you're usually scored on tests at some point. Okay, so this is a time to not zone out. Something really interesting happens on this problem that I want you to really look at. Okay, linear, yes. Equation, no. Inequality, sure. Can we do the same stuff on inequalities we do on equations? Absolutely. One exception, just mind that exception. Now, we notice something with decimals. Decimals are fractions. They're just hidden. And they're fractions over multiples of 10, which is really cool. Because in order to get rid of decimals, basically we just have to multiply by 10 or 100 or 1,000. And all that does, since we're in a base 10 number system, is move decimals one spot or two spots or three spots or however many spots is necessary to make every number up here a whole number. Now, that's the kind of big deal. If you need to move your decimals here to make everything a whole number, you're going to move everything, well, one decimal place. That's all it's going to take. That would make everything a whole number. If you had one with two numbers, you have to move everything two decimal places. Move your decimal places, the same number of spots for all your numbers, so that all your numbers become whole numbers. Now, this would move one spot, no question. This would move one spot, no question. This would move one spot, no question. But check this out. You can't forget about these two terms. You see, when you are moving decimal places, you are practically multiplying by 10 or 100 or 1,000. And you're doing it to both sides. Both sides would... Distribute, just like we learned a long time ago. They would distribute every term. So if you've got to multiply, I'm sorry, if you've got to move one decimal, you've got to move all the decimals, the same number of spots. One, 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 and even this one. Yeah, that's one X. If you multiply that by 10, that's what you're doing here. You're going to get 10 X. So if you had X with a one in front of it, that one X, that one has a decimal. When you move the decimal to the right, you've got to add a place value holder to make sure you have two decimal places at this point. Uh, you'd be in the tens digit. That's what's going on here. 
So when we move our decimals, every term gets its decimal moved. That means that we have now 8x minus 5, less than not 1x. That would be the killer. That's going to kill a lot of people. Now it's 10x plus 10 minus 5x. Does it make sense to you that if 1 changed to 10, 1x has to change to 10x? That's got to be the case. After this, for goodness sakes, it's really hard to work on both sides of an equation or inequality if you haven't combined like terms. Right now, this has no like terms, but this side does. It gets really confusing to look for the smaller variable before you've combined like terms because there's three of them. That's, that's not good. In order for you to work on both sides of the equation or inequality, you should have at most two terms on one side. This one's got three. If you have three terms in a linear expression, you can combine two of them. 8x minus 5 is not one of them. As soon as we combine like terms here, that makes things a lot nicer. Now, you probably can do the rest of it. Um, we're just going to get rid of the smaller variable. That's going to keep the variable on the left-hand side, which is where we want it. We remove variables by addition or subtraction, in this case subtraction, getting 3x minus 5. No problem. Don't change your inequality. We're not dividing yet. Add 5. Yeah, we get rid of our constant by addition or subtraction. Don't change your inequality. We're not dividing yet. Divide by 3. Yeah, you know what? We're dividing. But we're not dividing by a negative. So we're just going to end with x is strictly less than 5. Put that on a number line. Our variable is on the left-hand side. I love that. It points in the direction we should be graphing. The lack of an equal sign says you cannot include that number that, uh, that makes both sides equal in your solution set. We use parentheses. We read from left to right, starting at negative infinity, ending at positive 5, and using some parentheses to represent it. That's linear inequalities. That's how this stuff works. Now, I'm going to give you a uh, kind of application. Let's say that you score 74% on a math test out of 100. And your next test is out of 100. And most tests are because most teachers would put them out of 100%. So you score 74%. And you know that you need a B average to make it into your nursing program or whatever program you're going into. And so you go, oh man, I got to keep an 80% average. That's my B average. So what do I need to get at least, at least is an interesting term, isn't it? At least 80%. What do I need so that my average is at least 80%? So you score 74 We want our average at least 80%. At least 80%, or a score of 80. So let's say you score 74%, that means it's out of 100. Remember, 74 parts per 100. So you score 74%, you got, uh, or 74 out of 100, you get 74%. We want to average at least 80%. Do you remember word problems that we have verbal models? Guys, this is it. I just have to tell you what at least is. We know how to average. Average means add together, divide by the number of things you added. So we're going to add together 74, our score, plus x, the next score, divided by 2, the number of things we added. That's an average. We want it at least 80%. So here's a little cheat sheet for you. At least? If you have at least $20 in your pocket, you have more than or equal to $20. $20 I mean, if, if I say, oh man, I got at least 20 bucks, that means I could have 20 or higher. 20 satisfies it or more. At most means you have less than or equal to. I got at most $5 in the bank. That means that I could have five dollars, or I could have less than that, but I don't have more than five. Five is the limiting factor there. That's what these two words mean. So when you see at least, you're greater than or equal to. If you see at most, you're less than or equal to. Less than, well, that's obviously less than. Greater than or more than, that's obviously more than. So our verbal model says we want our average to be at least 80%. Well, we can already do this. At least 80. It's kind of cool, isn't it? So we know right now that we have most of our inequality done. The average. If 74 is your first score, 
and you don't know your second one, to average two things, you add them together and divide by two. To average three things, you add them together, you divide by three. To average anything, you add all the scores and divide by the number of scores you added. This would be the average of your test scores. 74% plus, I don't know what my next one is, Let's average them, and I want it to be at least 80. Higher than 80, or at the very minimum 80. That's the idea. Do you see fractions? Yeah. Get rid of your fractions. How? Get rid of your LCD. If this is 80 over 1, let's multiply both sides by 2. Our LCD is 2. Remember why we're doing it, though. We're only doing it to get rid of our denominators. On the left-hand side, we have 74 plus x. You've seen this before. That's why I'm going kind of quick. We did this in uh, linear equations. <clears throat> right hand side we got 160. Hey, we didn't multiply by a negative. You never will if you follow my steps. Get rid of your constant term by addition subtraction. 74 minus 74 is 0. 0 plus x, which is why we want to get zeros for addition, gives us back x. Do I need to change that inequality? Do I need to change that? Well, no, I didn't divide by a negative. Hmm. Let's use our calculators, use our heads, whatever you want to do. That's going to be 86. Now interpret it. What this tells you is that you need at least an 86%. So you, your score has to be more than 86, or at the bare minimum, 86 out of 100 to maintain your average of 80%. That's what this says. And you know what? You can test it. Add 86 plus 74. And divide by 2. See if it works out to 80. Uh, well, that's going to be 160. 160 divided by 2 is 80. That's the minimum score that you need, anything more than that. So that's one way to apply these two word problems, um, even to your real life, because you're probably going to want to see what you, you need to have for your next few tests to maintain the score that you want to pass the class with. I hope this helps you. I hope that this explains uh, linear inequality even more. Um, after this, this next video, we're going to be doing compound inequalities, dealing with and, dealing with or, seeing how we can combine these to make some more complicated ideas. And I'll see you next time.